can you hear me okay? If you can hear me okay, please uh, type in the chat box and let me know that you are doing okay and you can hear me well. Uh, Andy, I may not be able to see the chat box, uh, but could you please uh, tell me and let me know that uh, people can hear me okay. Yes, it's crystal clear. Thank you, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Edu Voice, an interview program by National Geographic Learning Vietnam. Thank you for joining us. And my name is Min Hui Chi. I'm the English language teaching specialist uh, from National Geographic Learning, and I'm your host today. Uh, so today I'm joining you from my home office. Uh, so please allow me to apologize in advance if suddenly you hear my newly adopted kitty cat meowing in the background. Uh, I think we should be okay. Uh, I, I hope so. Yeah, apologies in advance. So uh, for those of you who join our talk show for the first time today, um, EduVoice Vietnam is a series of interview programs conducted by National Geographic Learning Vietnam. Uh, our purpose with this program is to create a platform for educators to raise their voice and share their perspectives about the educational landscapes in Vietnam. And how do we do this? We do this by reaching out and interviewing uh, professionals in uh, education who can share their expertise on the topic of the day. And by doing so, we hope to build awareness and connections between you know, different parts of the community. Uh, and by the community, I mean you know, a variety of different um, education sectors, including government sectors, public schools, uh, private language schools, universities, colleges across Vietnam. So that's the purpose um, of our program. And for today's episode, uh, we are going to cover a topic which I think is getting you know, increasing significance and importance in English language education, uh, that is, social emotional learning. So as you might have been aware recently, the well, the mental well-being of students have gained, you know, increasing attention from both the media and educators alike. So, you know, in Vietnam, students have started going back to school, uh, but if you observe, you will see that actually our students are still facing a lot of you know ongoing issues after you know having to stay at home uh, studying online for years uh, due to the impact of COVID. So this leads me to you know some thinking you know how what can we do as educators what can we do to help students confront and manage those issues. And these are the questions that drove me to come up with um, this episode of Edivoice Vietnam with the topic of uh, social and emotional learning. Uh, before we dig deeper into the questions that are related to this topic and the questions that are related to you, uh, the participants of this episode, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, our guest speaker today is Catherine Stennett, and she is with me uh, on the camera. Uh, Kat, could I invite you to say hello to our participants and yes, uh, maybe hello. say where you are from, what time it is now, uh, where you are yeah. from? Yes, so hello to everyone, and thank you so much for giving up your time to attend this, and thank you, Chi, for just introducing the topic. Um, so yeah, my name is, is Kath, um, you can call me Kath, um, and I'm based in the UK, I'm based in West Sussex, which is down in the southeast, and amazingly, we actually have good weather today, which is, oh. if you know the UK, it's still rare in June, but today we have the sun is shining, and it's, it, I can hear the, my office is in the garden, and I can hear all the birds singing outside, okay. so it's, it's maybe really my lovely. maybe my cat can hear your bird singing. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so Kate, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation to be the guest speaker of today's talk show. Um, 
I know that you are an expert on social and emotional learning, but I think um, me personally and the audience could be very curious to know, you know, more about you. So could you please, you know, share with us, you know, um, your background in general and, and, you know, some things that drive you to where you are today? Uh, could you mm. spend some minutes sharing with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I started off in English language teaching, teaching English in Japan. And I lived there for a couple of years um, in the um, very long time ago, in the early 1990s, um, teaching a whole range of students. Um, and I absolutely love my time in Japan. But when I came back, um, I thought, I sort of reassessed how I taught. And I thought, actually, the thing I love most about teaching is creating my own materials. And that's the path down which I want to go. Um, and so I got into publishing, I worked in house in publishing for many years as an editor. And then eventually, uh, 1997, I think I went freelance, so I've been freelance for 25 years, started working for myself, and um, yeah, moved across very slowly into writing rather than editing materials, um, which is not an unusual path for people to take, um, but very much informed by my teaching experience in Japan. And also at the same time, um, I had children and that has definitely affected the way I think about teaching, um, looking at my own daughters and their experiences at school and their educational um, what they've benefited from educationally, what they've struggled with um, educationally. That's also been very, very interesting for me to see and, and to learn from. Um, and the other thing is that I'm a very part time, but I do some music teaching now as well. So I go Ooh. into a local primary school and I teach a little bit of recorder, a little bit of singing and do some choir work. And so that's that's great as well, because it means I still get to do a little bit of teaching, even if it's not language teaching. Um, and I just love having that interaction with young people. Yeah, that, that's very interesting to know. I didn't know that you teach people to play uh, some musical instruments. Yeah. I wonder if, you know, I wonder if that helps you balance your life. Uh, does it help you with, you know, social emotional learning or social emotional teaching or whatsoever? Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. And I think um, I think having been a parent really does as well. I think it, it gives you a whole new perspective. Um, but yes, I think that whole idea about finding balance and, you know, it's taken me a very long time to do it. But I would say I'm now there with my life. I have a really and I'm incredibly lucky. I'm not uh, I don't take it for granted, but I do have a very nice balance between my work and and doing things like actually I love my work which is so lucky in a way so I never dread uh, coming down to my office in the morning and uh, and opening up whatever I'm working on but also I'm doing a lot of music and like I said I'm spending time with young people and I think that's really important and as a writer you know you have to do that you, you have to really be with the people that you're writing for Hmm, exactly. Uh, right for a target audience, right? So talking yeah. about talking about balance, um, I find what you're sharing very interesting. Maybe uh, when I get a little bit less busy, I will pick up a piano lesson. Like I have always wanted to learn to play the piano, but I think, yeah, I've been delaying that for you know, trying to come up with excuses about being yeah. too busy <laughs> yeah. with work. But maybe yeah. later on, you know, we can discuss out of this talk show maybe we yes. can discuss further how to yeah. use music to balance your life you know for better uh, social and emotional um, yeah. management and so, and you know like like social and emotional learning with music it's one of those things that actually um, will help you to improve academically as well because you're mm -hmm. using so many different bits of your brain to produce music that it's um it's very good for you academically too mm -hmm. I'm sorry <laughs> that's an interesting point and I think we will get to that later on I'm curious to know more about that so going back a little bit about you know keeping balance in life um I would like to share with you and the audience here I think the audience in Vietnam I assume quite a lot of you are from Vietnam but maybe some of you are from other countries as well but for those who are in Vietnam, uh, recently um, on the media, there have been some news article about, you know, very unfortunate um, cases or situations where teens committed suicide uh, due to, you know, the 
due to the what has been said um, pressures from you know social distancing from the COVID the pandemic and also from the insensitive or insensitiveness from the parents leading to the teens committing suicide. And that is quite alarming. And that is the reason why I, you know, I came up with this topic for our discussion today. And I realized the importance of social emotional learning and the need to build um, social and emotional competencies for students. So let's get started with uh, the very first basic question about, you know, when we, when, when for any topic that we do, we always start with the what. So yeah. let's start with the definition of, you know, social and emotional learning. What do you think is social and emotional learning? Could you share with us? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so let me share my screen and then I can show you a very nice definition. Um, I want to share this one. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see you very clearly. Oh, and the slides. Good, excellent. Um, so this is the definition that has been um, uh, thought up by Castle, and Castle is the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. So I'll be mentioning that quite a lot during this discussion, I think. Um, it's one of the big organisations. It was, it was founded in the sort of mid-1990s. So it's been going for a long time. It was right at the forefront of talking about social and emotional learning. Um, and um, I would say if you're interested in finding out more, do check out their website. It's really, really helpful. So they've got a, this very nice definition. It's the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships and make responsible and caring decisions. And I would say to, to sort of reduce that down even more, that social and emotional learning is really about how you operate in society. So how you work together with other people. And in order to work together with other people, in order to operate in society well, you need to understand yourself as well. So once you can understand yourself, you can understand what motivates you, you can understand what makes you feel happy or what makes you feel sad, then you can start to develop a bit of empathy and you can begin to understand how other people react to things. And once you're beginning to understand that, then you can start thinking about working together as a community, as a society. And those are the kind of skills that are so important um, in life, it, definitely at school for students as they're growing up through school um, and and these kind of skills actually help them to achieve better academically as well. I uh, totally agree with you and I think this is important not just for the kids uh, but also for teens and for me personally as well and maybe for all participants in uh, the talk show today as well. So the, thank you for giving us the definition of social and emotional learning. It's broad and comprehensive. Um, I think maybe we can move on to discuss uh, one another aspect of it, that is the significance of social and emotional mm. learning. So could you mm. share with us why do you, uh, could you share with us um, the importance of social and emotional learning, especially in the current context, I mean, post-COVID. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you brought up the topic of, of sadly, there have been some, some suicides in Vietnam and mm -hmm. it, that's not, obviously it's not just in Vietnam, but throughout the world, there is, there is a bit of a crisis of mental health at the moment, particularly amongst young people. And obviously one of the reasons for that is the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so that has really disrupted learning. It's made um, young people were suddenly very isolated. Um, and I think one thing that's really important when you think about the pandemic, I mean, if I think about my age, I think, okay, I lost two years to the pandemic, mm -hmm. two years of social contact. Well, two years as a proportion of my life is it, that's okay two years out of I'll, I'll share with you my age I'm 56 so two out of 56 I can deal with that but two years out of an eight-year-old's life two year old two years out of a 10-year-old's life that's a much much bigger proportion and we have to accept how 
how much that can really affect children. It's a huge part of their life and it's an important part where they're growing and they're developing. So it's, it's gonna have a big, big impact on them and a, a big toll on their mental health. Um, and in fact, there was a recent UNICEF study that revealed that approximately 13% of adolescents aged between 10 and 19 suffer some form of mental disorder. So, you know, we need to address that. Um, and it's not enough to sort of think, OK, well, that's for the parents to look after. And at the school, we'll just do the teaching. We really have to address it as a society, mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, one of the things I'm really passionate about is this kind of holistic approach. You know, you can't just think, right, today I'm teaching English, so I'm going to teach the vocabulary and I'm going to teach the grammar. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, particularly in the current situation. Um, I've also put on this slide that it's highlighted inequities around well-being, and it is unfortunately the children with lower income parents um, who particularly suffered because, of course, they didn't have access. It's not just that they didn't have access to Wi-Fi or computers, but they may well have had less access to their own space, mm -hmm. um, less access to, to a place where they can study. Their parents may have had a lower level of education which meant they were not able to be so supportive or they were not able to be around so much so there are all sorts of things that have really affected children um, and young people during the pandemic and i think now if we we try and really incorporate social and emotional learning into our teaching practice it will provide a tremendously supportive nurturing environment for them um, it's it's just I feel so passionately, you know, it's not something that you should be doing um, at five o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday when you've done all your proper teaching. OK, now let's just do an hour of social and emotional learning. That's not the way <laughs> we need to do it. It needs to be incorporated into everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm so much with you on that. And uh, I would like to share with you a local context related to what you just said. Um, so I love the idea that you mentioned that we should look at this uh, from a holistic approach. But we don't, you know, as in we don't teach social emotional learning separately. Mm. And then what you just said earlier, uh, like after 5pm, and then the class will move on to a, a follow up or maybe an extracurricular class. Uh, to teach kids about social emotional learning. But as, as far as my observation goes, this is exactly what happened in Vietnam, or at least mm -hmm. in Hanoi, where I was born and grew up. Uh, well, and this applies to my son as well. He's a, he's a fifth grader now. Uh, so during his primary education, um, his master teachers would, you know, send out a piece of paper to uh, the children's parents asking for, you know, asking if the parents want to send their kids to a, a life skill uh, extracurricular class after yeah. the mainstream classes. And I see that lots of parents are, are sending kids to those classes because maybe there's a gap in the education system where we don't teach about social emotional learning, we don't teach kids about life skills, we don't integrate this into mm. the curriculum. And that's the reason why parents have to send the kids to mm. you know, extracurricular classes. So yeah, really, I really like um, the idea of taking a holistic approach to you know, social emotional learning and teaching. Uh, I think we can dig deeper into that a little bit later when we talk about, you know, other stakeholders, but I'm curious to know more about, you know, what makes social and emotional learning? What do you think mm -hmm. comprises it? Could you okay. share with us? Yeah. That? <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those sort of big umbrella terms that different people and different organizations have different definitions of it. Um, but I really like the castle definition. So I'm just going to show you a, a bit more deeply how they how they categorize it. Uh, so they divide it into these five sections, the self-awareness, self-management, um, and those are the kind of understanding yourself sections. And then we've got getting on with other people, that social awareness and relationship skills. And then there's responsible decision making, which is a kind of combination of all of those so if we just dive a little bit deeper into each one of those self-awareness is about being able to identify your own emotions um, 
developing your interests, examining your prejudices. It's just about understanding yourself. Um, it also includes having a growth mindset, and I'm sure that growth mindset is another one of those buzzwords that you will have heard around the place a lot. Yes. yes. Um, but yeah, so that's what self-awareness is. But there's no point in being self-aware if you then can't manage yourself. So if you if you're able to say, oh, I, I'm I recognize the fact that right now I'm feeling very, very angry, but there's nothing I can do about that. I'm just going to have a complete temper tantrum and shout at everyone. Well, <laughs> that's not very helpful. So mm -hmm. you need to develop that way of managing your emotions. Um, you know, how can you how can you control yourself? How can you recognize? How can you um, understand the things that maybe trigger particular emotions in you? All those kind of things. How can you manage your stress? Uh, how can you exercise self-discipline? And self-discipline is a really, really important skill that we should all have. And it can be quite difficult to teach that to children when they're so used to discipline being imposed from the school. So being able to manage your own time and manage your own um, goals is, is all falls under self-management. Um, social awareness is obviously things like empathy, showing concern for others, and um, taking other people's perspectives. Um, so that, you know, there are some people who, who very much struggle to do that, for example, um, young people who may be on the autistic spectrum, that's mm -hmm. something that can be very challenging, which is to understand how other people uh, are feeling, but there are ways that we can try and help people develop that, it's easier for some than for others. Um, also, identifying diverse social norms, so really being un understanding that what's, what's normal for you and your family or you and your culture isn't the same all the world round that people have different norms different standards um, and to, and to identify them and then we move on to relationship skills which is all about communication and i think you know in the english language classroom we're very good at, at teaching communication we do a lot of listening and speaking and reading and writing so i think our students get a lot of practice in that which is great um, and also practicing teamwork as well of course you know if you're doing group work and pair work in your classes, then your students are getting lots of, of practice in that. So that's really good. There's also um, demonstrating cultural competence. So that means really understanding culturally um, where you stand in your culture and how that relates to other people and how you can be culturally um, empathic, how you can understand other people. And then finally, the last one, the, the dark green one on that slide responsible decision making which is about being curious being open-minded and using your critical thinking skills trying to identify solutions to problems and understanding the consequences of your actions so um all of those are on the castle website and they have this this um diagram i've kind of copied from there and there's a very nice little interactive thing on their website where if you click each of those sectors of the circle, it will come up with explanations and descriptors. So it's, it's really worth having a look. But that's those are the sort of five key areas that make up social and emotional learning. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you a follow up question on this? Mm. You know, uh, so of all these five uh, aspects or the five components of social and emotional learning, which one do you think is the most important or do you think these are equally important <laughs> oh, oh i think they are, i think they are all really important yeah i don't i don't like having to say one's more important than the other because they're linked you know then they're, mm. they're linked to each other it was like i was saying about the emotions thing you know you can't you can't manage your anger until you can recognize and identify your anger and um you can't manage it really until you can see the effect that it has on other people so they're they're very much linked together. So I, I wouldn't like to say that one's more important than the other, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Um, so, because all of these are important. So what do you think we should focus on to build first? I assume maybe that should be, you know, starting with the self first, um, self-awareness. Uh, yeah, what do you think? I think so. Yeah, I think. I think understanding yourself, and I think that's what we do anyway in primary schools. Children do a lot of that understanding about themselves. You know, when you ask them to write about their families or about what they like doing, their interests or their favorite color or their favorite animal, 
Um, and when you maybe in primary schools, you get them to work a little bit with emotions and you say, what makes you feel sad or what makes you feel happy? Mm -hmm. So children do that. And we do that in schools and we do that as, as parents or in families automatically, I think. We, we get children thinking about themselves and that automatically leads to thinking about other people around them. Because when you're in a classroom and you hear different children talking about different things, you suddenly realize, oh, you know, maybe not everyone in this classroom has a mummy and a daddy, or maybe not everyone mm. in this classroom is scared of dogs or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you start and you, you can't do that if, you just, if you're just an isolated person. But once you're in the classroom and you're really doing those activities where you're listening to each other, you, you start to understand your place in society. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, and um, I would like to follow up on one of the points that you mentioned just now, when I asked about, you know, how to start or what to focus on to start building, you know, social and emotional learning, you tend to give a lot of examples with you know kids at primary education is this because social and emotional learning and teaching are easier to be conducted at primary education the reason why i ask this is because recently i came across a an article by uh, professor Huyn van Sun, who he is the rector of ho chi minh university of pedagogy and he and his colleagues did a research in Vietnam mm. uh, and the research findings showed that actually it is quite challenging to integrate social and emotional learning in secondary education. Um, I'm not sure if this is true and I would like to draw on your expertise and insights into this matter. So could you? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's not just in Vietnam. I think it's everywhere. I think primary schools tend to be much more, you know, in English, we sort of say touchy feely. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's much more about having fun and, and doing stuff and learning about each other. And then in secondary school, you have, you have the exams looming, don't you? And mm -hmm. that really affects, I think, um, how, how we, how we manage to incorporate social and emotional learning into secondary school education. Um, so these are some of the things I've just put on a slide here, what the, the things that I think are problematic. Mm -hmm. So once we get into secondary school, we have those issues where discipline is much stricter and there's, there's a good reason for that, but there's a focus on discipline, exam results and academic achievement. And I think there's sometimes a bit of a panic amongst teachers where they think I haven't got time for the social and emotional learning stuff, because yeah. I've got this much syllabus I have to teach, you know, I have to mm. teach all this fact, or I've got to get the present perfect and the past perfect and the first, second and third conditional to all taught by mm. the end of this term, I don't have time for anything else. Yeah, um, maybe I have KPIs to, uh, to yeah. get over like your yeah, key performance indicators. Some schools okay. in Vietnam teachers are imposed with KPIs, you know, how much percentage of your class passed the exam? So that's right. kind of a lot of pressure. Yes, yeah. huge pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and then as I've put there, social and emotional learning, and I mentioned that earlier, then becomes an extracurricular activity mm -hmm. or an after school club. Um, instead of being incorporated and integrated into school subjects. And I think a lot of the problem is really with teacher training. So mm -hmm. I think possibly, I mean, I can't speak for Vietnam, but I think possibly teachers are not supported enough to understand how to just incorporate social and emotional learning into their lessons, rather than thinking, oh, I've got to do a bit on social and emotional learning. It's not like that. It's like how to just incorporate it into the lessons. And they worry that they're suddenly gonna have to bring in lots of games and, and do lots of stuff that may be outside of their comfort zone and that lessons will become very chaotic and that it will be difficult to manage classrooms. Um, so those are all, issues in secondary schools. The other thing is that students themselves are changing. And, you know, those of you who are uh, participating today, you know, if you're teaching kids aged between, say, 10 and 15, you'll see how much they change massively. And one of the things that really breaks my heart when I see kids growing up is suddenly 
when they become self-conscious and they want to be cool and they suddenly start worrying a lot more about what their peers think of them and they don't want to maybe that be so honest about their emotions and it's you know it's part of growing up it's it's completely part of growing up but I, I also do find it a bit heartbreaking because uh, that was me when I was yeah young. like yeah. I I tend to you know crawl under my own shell uh yeah. I was so self-conscious I don't I didn't want to share anything with any others so yeah yeah heartbreaking yeah. indeed it is it's tough it's so tough um and and also then there's what's going on with the with the teenage brain. So the, the teenage brain as it develops, the frontal region um, develops more slowly than the deeper brain structures. And what that means is that teenagers are much less able to control their emotional actions. They're less able to control their behavior. So they can sometimes seem much more impulsive. Um, mm. They can suddenly get angry very quickly or suddenly burst into tears. Um, and, and that's embarrassing for them because it's in front of their peers, like I said. So there are all these things going on at secondary school that we have to think about um, that make it make it very, very challenging. So it's, mm. it's not surprising that we see a dip. And, you know, uh, the OECD, the, uh, oh gosh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, I think it is, it did a, a survey, of, very recently did a survey into social and emotional learning, and it what it did was it did a survey on 10 year olds and on 15 year olds and it found very very noticeable dip from the 10 year olds there's a sudden dip in their social and emotional skills when they reach 15. Wow. so yeah you so know it's, it's it tangibly is, there yeah it is even more important to integrate social and emotional learning into secondary education yes yes and what what have you just shared just now uh makes me very aware of the upcoming time when my son grows into a teenager i should be prepared for all of this <laughs> <laughs> good luck <laughs> yeah uh, so thank you for that lovely sharing and i think i maybe we should look at uh bigger structures now maybe we should mm -hmm. look at you know how all the related stakeholders can be involved um to address um, this topic of social emotional learning. So what do you think, you know, how can schools as a whole can help to develop social and emotional competencies for students? Mm. Do you have any mm. advice for us as an expert in this field? I've got some ideas. Yeah, I've got some <laughs> ideas. So um, First of all, I think one of the problems is that um, schools are really based around, well, a lot of secondary schools seem to be based around that kind of getting qualifications, passing exams. Um, and, and they do that in, a, of course, they have to find ways that are quantifiable. In other words, tests. So how can we quantify how good you are at English? Let's see how many of these vocabulary questions you get right. Let's see how good your grammar is in this gap fill test. So it's a very kind of, structured disciplined way of of testing and, and it's not just english language but everything else that you learn at school tends to be tested in that very kind of quantifiable way so you have a nice number at the end and you can say oh look 70 percent of my students in this class got over 80 percent in this test so i am teaching very effectively of course that's much more difficult with social and emotional learning so i think what schools need to do and what um curriculum need, leaders need to do is to discuss how they can recognize the acquisition of social and emotional skills in schools and it needs to be recognized you know so that there might be ways that you can you can show that it's really important and that it's a value and that it's a value that is respected and admired and and it is just as important a value as doing well in your exams so I think that's a discussion that the whole school needs to have with the teachers and the administrators and the, and the school leaders to think, what can we do in this school to, to really prove that it's important? It's not enough just to say it's, it's terribly important to be empathetic, everyone, be nice to each other. You know, you have to actually have something that students do that prove that they are acquiring those skills. So I think that's quite a challenge. And I think that's that's something globally we really need to work on and think about and you know i mean i hate i hate the whole focus on passing and ex exams but also i recognize the fact as a parent 
you know, I know that I want my kids to do well in their exams. Ultimately, I can preach all this stuff. But uh, sure, at the end of the day, I, I want my kids to come home with good qualifications, good mm. exams, because it gets them on in the world. So we need to find some way of recognizing social and emotional learning within that framework. Um, we need to do more training in schools. And I think we could really help with teachers sharing their best practices. And actually, I genuinely think that as English language teachers, we have a lot to share with teachers from other subjects because we do do a lot of communication. We do a lot of, you know, we have to encourage our students to speak. It's a really important part of learning a language. Whereas maybe in a maths class, you know, that it might be more acceptable for students to be completely quiet through a whole maths class. But, um, you know, for their social and emotional learning, it's good to get students communicating. And we do that in the English language classroom. So perhaps we can share some of our practices with our colleagues on in other subjects. Um, uh, we, can, we can talk about, yeah, how we can incorporate things into our curriculum. Um, yeah, the other thing is connecting the school with the wider community. So, um, you know, part of social and emotional learning, as I said, it's not just about understanding yourself, it's how you relate to society, it's how you relate to the community. And I would just give a little push to National Geographic learning here because I do think that our books really do that. They really help children understand the whole world around them. But as a school, you can make connections with people out there in the community. Um, so maybe there are charities that are working in uh, local charities that are working in areas that you think might be interesting to students. Um, for example, say you want to look at the environment, maybe there are, maybe there's a, a local recycling initiative or um, what else, if you're, if you're looking at the arts, maybe there's a local theater group or there might be a local music group. Get those members of the community into the school and get them talking to the students so that the students have role models. And I think that's really important to have role models and to have mentors. Um, one of the, the problems I think, you know, there are a lot of fantastic things about social media, but if your role models are people on Instagram or mm. um, TikTok, who look stunning and have, seem to have the most beautiful houses and never seem to do anything wrong and can do incredible dances or sing amazing songs, you just sort of start to feel a bit worthless because you're never going to be like those people. Mm. It's so much, so much more helpful for students to meet a guy down the road who's helping his neighbor by taking out her bins and doing her garden. Let him come in and talk to the school about something that's really real, that's rooted in reality. So I, th I think that's something that, I, I mean, I have no idea in Vietnam whether schools do that already, but I can tell you in the UK, they don't do enough of that. They mm. don't do enough of it. And I, I think it's, I think that will be hugely beneficial. Yeah, I think, um, in, I think in Vietnam, actually quite a lot of schools are doing that. You know, they are also send uh, children to children children out to do charity work or join yeah, different right. organizations to do environmental protection activities uh, but yeah. not all not all uh, and not as many as we hope uh, to have uh, due to you know different conditions and different constraints um, yeah 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 administrative issues or you know management uh challenges or yeah. etc et yeah but we've seen uh, some co going on and that's um that's mm. that's good yeah i think that's really good and the other thing is communicating with parents because as i said earlier you know as a parent myself i completely understand that parents can be very focused on academic achievement mm. and i know that that puts a pressure on teachers and it puts a pressure on schools and that you can have parents saying, oh, why are you wasting your time on this? I really want to, you know, I, I really want you to be spending more time teaching the curriculum to my kids. So it's really important for schools to educate parents as well and to talk to them about how there, there are concrete examples of how social and emotional, the development of social and emotional skills enables students to achieve more academically. There are loads of examples of that. There's loads of research into that, that well-balanced happy, fulfilled um, students are much better able to learn. So it's not a waste of time getting to them to that point. Um, and if you can get the parents on board and also you can share that vocabulary around the school um, with everyone and with the parents, 
then um, you know that's really helpful too. And I'll just get slightly sidetracked onto vocabulary because talking about growth mindset, I remember as a parent um, going to a musical concert at my daughter's secondary school. And uh, so that all the sort of vaguely musical children were going up there and playing their violin and singing their songs and all the rest of it. And at the end, the head teacher stood up and um, he said, uh, we've really enjoyed this concert. He said, none of your children are talented. They're not talented. They've just worked really hard. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, I know what you're trying to say. And you, you've read the thing on growth mindset. Uh -huh. But that's the most negative thing I think mm. I've ever heard anyone say. Mm. And what a stupid thing to say it to parents as well. You know, parents, of course, they think their children are talented. Don't tell parents their kids aren't talented. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. So you have to, you know, as teachers, you have to talk about what do you actually mean when you say growth mindset? Do we really mm. mean that kids aren't talented? Of course we don't. That's not what it means. So that everyone's saying the same thing. Um, that's really important. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on the importance of involving parents in the social and emotional learning of children. Um, and, you know, actually, um, schools can communicate with parents that, you know, actually research shows that if your children are socially and emotionally healthy, actually this will lead to academic success. One mm -hmm. of the big reasons that leading to academic success and they, maybe they will feel you know, reassured, uh, okay, I need to focus on this so that my kids can do better in the exam, maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we've looked at, you know, different stakeholders um, that are involved in, you know, the development of social and emotional learning among um, uh, kids and teenagers. Uh, we've looked at, you know, what uh, school administrators can do. We've looked at uh, curriculum developers, what they can do. They can integrate social and emotional learning into the curriculum. We've looked at the role of parents and what they can do. Um, in this, you know, uh, social and emotional learning thing. And, you know, we've also looked at the community as a whole, you know, what they can do to have reinforce, develop uh, children's social and emotional learning. So I'd like to, you know, take a step back or step further. Maybe we look at something more specifically from the community Mm -hmm. Now we look at the classroom, mm -hmm. the teachers, you know, yeah. maybe the most direct uh, influencer on children's uh, emotional, social and emotional learning. Uh, what do you think teachers can do to help students develop social and emotional competencies? Yes, good question. So um, project-based learning is a great mm. way to start. So that's really a really interesting way of, of uh, incorporating a lot of social and emotional skills when you, when you use project-based learning. For starters, you're usually getting your students to work together. So generally speaking with a project, you're putting your students in a group. Um, they will probably be using their critical thinking skills to do their own research. Um, you have to hand over a bit of responsibility to them because it's their project and they, they, you should allow them some leeway in deciding how they're going to present a project. Like, is this going to be a presentation or is it going to be a booklet or is it going to be a, a, a video? So where they really dive deep into a topic as a team, so they're working together, they're, uh, they're making decisions, they're using the critical thinking. Um, what else are they doing? They're listening to each other. They're communicating. So I think I think that is one really, really interesting way of going. I'm not saying that all lessons should be based around projects, but maybe if each term you can get students together working on a project that is is, you know, with I mean, we're so lucky with English language teaching because that could be a project about anything. As long as they're doing it in English, yeah. that's great. So mm. we're really lucky. I mean, we're not like you know, we're not teaching physics where our project has to be related to physics. It can be anything they want. And yeah. it's so important. Um, and, you know, Andrew, I can see in the in the chat box that you're agreeing that you 
it's difficult as a teacher, I understand that, but sometimes you have to hand over to the student and say, okay, you get to choose. You can choose mm. how you want to do this, or you can choose um, when you want to do your research, or you can choose if you want to work in a small group or a big group. And this is your opportunity with project-based learning to, to bring that into the classroom. Mm. Um, yeah, that's nice that um, mm. a comment, I'm so sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but yeah. they can be anything with any whom they want. Yeah, which is that's exactly, so yeah. yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Mm. Flipped learning, which is where you ask your students to do the basic work at home. So you might say to them, okay, um, I want you to uh, find out how to make a present perfect sentence. Just find out the structure. I'm not going to tell you, you need to find that out and bring it into the classroom next week. And then when you're in the classroom, you can focus a lot more on the interesting things like understanding when you use the present perfect and doing something maybe more creative, like maybe personalizing information using the present perfect so that you're not spending time in the classroom particularly in secondary school I mean this is mm -hmm. less relevant for primary school but in secondary school you're giving students again some responsibility for their learning you're getting them to do their own research and then when they come back into the classroom you're getting them to use their social and emotional skills by sharing what they've learned by communicating by being creative um, so I think flip learning can be a bit daunting as a teacher if you're not used to that, if you're used to being very in charge of the classroom. Um, but I think certainly for, for your secondary school students, it's something they can really benefit from. Um, and I'm sure that as well, actually, when we've all been having to teach over Zoom in the last couple of years, yeah. um, we've had to do that a lot as well. Yeah. Um, involve students in decision-making. So I, I've mentioned this before, um, and I do feel really strongly about this because I think often what we do is we pay lip service. So we sort of say, oh, yes, you know, we'll give you a choice. But actually, you don't give students a choice at all. You just kind of pretend <laughs> to. Um, but you do genuinely need to allow students to make decisions and make choices, even if you can see that they're, it's not necessarily going to work. You need to let them find that out for themselves and let them discover new paths. So whether that's with a project, if you think, oh, gosh, you know, why have you chosen that as your project topic? You're really going to struggle with that. Instead of saying, no, that's wrong, say, well, you know, have a week to think about it. And um, you, you're, you can change your mind if you want to give the decision over to them. So it's, it's really useful to do that with students. And it, you know what? It prepares them for life. It prepares them for the world Agreed. because the world is not about everyone telling you what to do you at some point you have to go out there and make your own decisions i can um, actually apply this in into teaching my son as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's so difficult i think as a parent it's really difficult you know and i and my daughters are older so my daughters are 17 and 21 now but you know certainly with the 17 year old there are times when i think Oh, you know that's even if it's what she's wearing it's like no, no. but <laughs> you just have to stop yourself and think do you know what you you need to find that out for yourself yes. I can't just tell you it all the time totally agree <laughs> yeah um so what else teach the key social emotional learning vocabulary so so when you use words like empathetic or growth mindset or uh responsible decision making Everyone in the classroom knows what you mean. You have the same framework, you have the same definitions. So they need to be part of your classroom vocabulary. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just reading that comment. Does it seem to you that any whom is a new concept? Well, any whom I, is not a word I've come across before, but I knew what you meant. So, <laughs> but it may, may work, uh, maybe more American English than British English. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was very understandable, so I knew what you meant. Um, yeah, so what was I talking about? Key social and emotional learning vocabulary. Yeah, so that everyone knows what you're talking about. And you really want to get almost to the point where your students sigh and go, oh, I'm talking about empathy again. Oh, no. <laughs> but at least they know what you mean, you know, mm -hmm. even if they're sick of hearing you talking about it. So I think that's important. And, you know, including authentic real world material. And again, I'll say with National Geographic Learning, and I've got a couple of things to share with you actually to, to show you how we do yeah. that in National Geographic Learning. Yes, please. Um, because it's so important. So for example, um, 
uh, one of the courses that I've recently uh, written and been involved with is New Close Up. And that's our exam course that goes from A2 through to C1. Um, and it's, it's focused all around exams. But while we were developing that course, we were talking a lot about social and emotional learning. We were saying, mm. why do we feel, you know, even with an exam course, it tends to be very, very focused on the structures and the grammar and the functions. And nevertheless, we need to really recognize that other things are important and we need to prepare our students. And, you know, when students take exams, they need to be in a good place in terms mm. of stress management and mental yeah. health. So we need to address that as well. So in new close up, after every two units, we have a little spread called live well, study well. I'm going to show you one of those now. Yeah, it was about um, So this particular one, which is from the B1 level, is all about dealing with difficult situations and problem solving. So what we do is we'll start off with some kind of input. So it might be an infograph. It might be a survey. This is a little text and it's all about difficult situations. Um, so it's all about how you deal with difficult situations and it gives an example. Um, do you get, uh, so this is an example where the, you buy a game and it stops working. So what do you do? Do you get angry? Do you stay calm? So it's talking about how you deal with that. And then you'll ask students to make a sort of personal reflection on that. And then we have these strategies. We have a mind your mind strategy. So in each of these spreads, We'll have a strategy and this one's about positive problem solving uh, and you get students to reflect on that so in this case we're talking about you can choose how you deal with this difficult situation try not to let your feelings control how you respond think more time and this is so good think more time about thinking thinking about possible solutions than the problem itself it's so easy isn't it to get caught up in worrying so much about the problem and actually it's better to think okay Rather than just panicking about the problem, let's think of five solutions and then I can choose the best one. Mm. Um, and if you feel angry or upset, remember this feeling won't help you to solve the problem. So they're really good social and emotional strategies. And of course, they're all in English. So you're practicing English at the same time with your students. None of it's a waste of time. You're getting them to reflect on those important things. And then we always finish off with a project. project and there's then, a choice. As you mentioned earlier. Yes, exactly. And uh, and I talked about how important it is to give students choice. And we always give a choice of two projects. And one of the projects will be if students prefer to work on their own. So some students may really not want to work in teams. OK, you can work this on your own. So project two is, is one that students can do on their own. So it's writing a diary entry. Project one, they're working in pairs. So it's, it's a really nice little page that um, isn't isn't specifically focused on the exams but it still is really helping to support students in all those other things that are important when they take exams like in this in this particular case mm. dealing with difficult situations mm. i really like um, this approach you know who who could you know who could imagine that a an exam preparation textbook can include social and emotional learning into it and actually is a nice combination, a perfect combination to help students succeed at school and at life as well. And I think yeah. that that holistic approach to social and emotional learning and to students own development is the right way to go. So yeah, thank you for sharing this uh, interesting yeah. approach. <laughs> that's okay mm. i've got one more i'm aware of time do we have to finish in four minutes yeah i i think yeah we can finish in four or five minutes yeah okay all right very very quickly i'll just show you show you one more so this is just a text from look which is our primary course this is level five and this is um very typical of national geographic learning in that you know, we, we try to teach children all about the world around them and about different people in different circumstances. So this is a text about a circus. But what students learn when they read about the circus is that there are young people and these are young people who've actually had very difficult lives. They've had problems at school. Uh, they've had problems at home. And this uh, circus school gives them a chance to be world class performers. So that's an interesting thing in a way. It's very interesting to learn about circus, but it's also just giving the message. Think about the people around you. Think about the fact that 
people have different stories and different lives and people have different ways of working through it. So even texts like that, texts rooted in the real world and different cultures are, are very, very supportive of social and emotional learning. Mm -hmm. Understand others so that you can have empathy for them, right? Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the students, we've talked about, a lot about the stakeholders that can help students to address social and emotional learning. But I think it would be a mistake to not involve actually the most important stakeholder, that is the teachers themselves. What about yes. teachers' social well, social and mental well-being as well? So. Do you have any advice for us teachers? What can we do to take care of our own, you know, social and emotional well-being? Do you have yeah. any advice? <laughs> well, it is difficult. Yes, it is all about trying to find that balance, I think. Um, and, Play music. And finding, yeah, exactly. For me, it's music. And um, everyone, I, I really, I believe this, you know, and I believe it so much with children as well when you see there are some children that really struggle at school. And to be honest with you, I struggled at school a lot. Uh, not academically, I just struggled socially at school because I'm quite an introvert. And so school was, was difficult for me because I had to be with lots of people all the time. Um, but what you need to do is, as a person, as a teacher, you need to find the thing that makes your heart sing, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that is, the thing that That's makes lovely. you happy and try and incorporate that into your life. Um, if you can incorporate it into your working practice, that's fantastic. That may not work, but don't don't forget about that. And everyone's got something. Everyone's got something that makes them feel good. Um, mm. So bring that into your life. That that's interesting, and that's actually quite basic and simple, right? Um, I yeah. know one of my colleagues. Uh, her name is Julie Huang. Actually, she's in this meeting in this talk show. <laughs> I know she loves biking and she tries to incorporate that into her work by, you know, working on a bike station and attending Perfect. meetings uh, or giving, yeah. you know, webinars. Fantastic. And that's lovely. <laughs> yeah. I would like to be Julie Huang one day. <laughs> 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 she's ha ha on the chat box <laughs> i think yeah i think time's up we have only one minute left so do you have any you know any final takeaway messages you would like to share to the participants today something that they can you know take uh take with them to their home um what would i say i would say just try and find out a little bit more about social and emotional learning go and visit that castle website um yeah try and try and get your life in balance and also model what you want your students to be like so if you are empathetic if you're uh if you are in control of your emotions if you communicate well with other people you are being a fantastic role model for your students and that is hugely important I totally yeah. with you. Uh, start with ourselves first. As teachers, take care of your own social uh, and emotional uh, learning and or well-being. And then once you are good, uh, you can help to make others around you good as well. So yes. uh, one hour has passed by very quickly. Uh, thank you so much, Kat for your time and wonderful sharings especially um, about um, social emotional learning. Thank you for giving examples. Um, the books that you shared uh, sound amazing. And um, I would also like to thank um, our regional marketing team for helping to make uh, this EduVoice episode a success. I would also like to thank my colleagues in the Vietnam team uh, for helping me to deliver this uh, talk show with you. And last but not least, I would like to send our sincere thanks to all of you, the participants. Absolutely. I know a lot of you here are teachers, uh, lecturers, researchers. I know quite a lot of you here are also ad are school administrators who are very concerned about you know, how to run your school effectively to take care of students' social and emotional learning. So thank you so much. Um, I think we will end uh, our talk show here, but before we do so, please help us to fill out a survey, a short survey will, will take you like one minute of your time, and uh, that will help us improve our upcoming talk shows in the future. And for those of you who are interested in hearing uh, about our 
hearing and watching our talk show again, please feel free to log into our Edu Voice Vietnam website. Andy, could you please drop that uh, to the chat box? And last but not least, I would like to say thank you to Andy. Uh, Andy is my colleague who is moderating the chat box today. And until next time, take care.